Um, so my name's Hannah O'Keefe. I'm a training fellow in the evidence synthesis team at Newcastle University. I am going to take a slightly different approach to everybody else's talks today, and I'm looking at our pipelines and what we can do beyond just statistics. Um, I've kept this very, very simple. It's aimed at the complete beginners within the group. So I hope you find it of some interest um, as we go through. So the first thing I need to say is confessions. I am a training fellow in the evidence synthesis group. The majority of my work is training as an information specialist within the information research team. We do a lot of work on HTA reports, and these are quite often involving systematic reviews and economic evaluations. And we work very closely with the health economics group for the economic evaluation side of things. But my main role is involved in the literature searching and gathering up that body of evidence to put into these HTA reports. Now, I've been working with R for about four years. I consider myself to be sort of moderate intermediate R user. I am by no means an expert. And I am definitely not an economist. I have to point that out from the start. So this is my get out jail free card, if you like. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about how I use R. And this is primarily, as I've said, to do with the literature searching. So I'm using sort of key papers that have been recommended by clinicians or experts in the field for our HDA reports. And I'm using text mining approaches to drive and draw out some of the information from those papers to be able to help me to design and develop my search strategy so I can go away and use that to find the evidence. And I tend to build small pipelines using different R packages with different functions that allow me to pass this text along the chain and come up with these graphic or tabular outputs. And the outputs that I generally tend to look for in my work are things like word frequency, so how often a words or phrase is occurring. I'm looking for words that are very rare within these texts, but very important for the stuff that we're working on. And I'm looking for alternative words, so things like antonyms and synonyms. And I'm going to talk you through these a little bit and give a couple of examples of the packages that I use. So the first thing is first is where do I find these packages? Instantly, I go to CRAM. This is a comprehensive R archive network. It's a massive network with thousands of packages that have come from people all over the globe. And it is growing on a daily basis. There's extensive documentation, there's examples. And I go for tutorials, look at Google, go to different forums. These are great sources of information. They often give a lot of demonstrations and step-by-step -step walkthroughs, as we heard from Edna before. There's so much information out there now on R is picking up quite intensely, and people are using it a lot, lot more in their research. And I suppose my basic starting point is always what do I want to achieve out of my analysis? What is my end goal and where do I want to go? And by figuring that out, that kind of helps me then to pick up the packages that I need to be able to create these pipelines. And so my first step is trying to get the literature into R. Now, R is notoriously difficult when it comes to reading PDFs and things like that. Um, but there are a lot of packages out there with these functions. So things like Reader, Text Reader, and Tabulizer are common packages that I would use to help me import data. And this can be in the form of PDFs, Word documents, Excel files. It could be a reference management software that's importing references to look at. And that just really gets the data in there in the first place. I then process the text a little bit and things like removing stop words and punctuation and think about which parts of the text that I really want to look at. Am I bothered about the reference list? Probably not. Am I bothered about the acknowledgements or the funding sections? Probably not. There's not a wealth of information in there. What I'm most likely to look at is things like the abstract or the results sections of papers. They're going to come out with a lot of rich information from these texts. And so I'd use things like GSUB and Regex and one of the lovely packages called TM that helps me just clear out some of this stuff that I'm not interested in. And once I've done that, I've then got this corpus of text, which has got stuff that's of interest to me. And maybe look at some of the word frequencies. So this will often give you things like council scores or percentages. 
you can take it very broad where it looks at all the information in the text or you can make it quite narrow so you might be interested in the top 10 words that most frequently occurring or the bottom 10 that don't occur very often within these papers and you can use other packages like snowball c is z to try and stem these words so if we look at the little graph i've got here you can see that the second word is alcohol and the third word is alcoholic well i might not want those separately i might want oops, Apologies, anything to do with alcohol. So I can stem the word alcoholic to just down to alcohol. And that will combine these counts. And this helps me really in terms of seeing what's most common, again, seeing what's rare, but very important within this text. And it helps me just to break down this text a little bit. And it can be easily presented in graphs, tables, whichever you're most comfortable at looking at. And in terms of using it within the economics portion of a HTA report, it might be quite useful when looking at the adverse events. So we can draw out those, those common words around adverse events. If we have a body of text and we know that headaches is coming up very, very frequently, we know that's probably a good adverse event that we need to look at somewhere in our economic models. I've got things like topic modeling that I do, and this allows the words to sort of be clustered in small groups and they derive these, these themes or these clusters and common ideas within the text. And again, these can be represented visually, things like rev tools and LDA viz are very good for producing these sorts of graphs. And it might help you then to allow you to select out a cluster of papers, things that have commonalities between them. And that might help in things like subgroup analysis. So it's quite a nice way of just drawing out those papers without having to go through them all by hand to try and figure out which ones belong in which groups. We've got things like finding alternative words. Again, this tends to use a thesaurus approach, things like SIN, QDAP dictionaries and WordNet are really good packages for this. And it's tailored to individual words, so I can isolate a word and look for any of the synonyms that are in there, and it will give me a lovely long list of all these things. But it helps identify alternative descriptions, and that's quite a key thing here, and we can relate that back to the word frequency. So again, if I'm looking at those rare but important words, what we might find is that something's very rare and only popping up once or twice in papers, but looking at synonyms or antonyms of this word, it's occurring very frequently and very commonly in the other papers. And so it just gives us a way of identifying those different descriptions within the text. And this is very, very useful when it comes to things like quality of life data, because we know that that is an absolute nightmare in some cases because it's quite often described in very different ways. And it might not always be clear that these quality of life measures are the same thing. But looking at these sort of different alternative words, it can help to sort of draw that information out a little bit. I can then do things like sentiment analysis. And this will show me positive, negative, neutral sentiment. And I can do this on a broad approach where it looks at the entire set of papers altogether. I can do it on a paper by paper approach. I can look at just the abstract or just the results or even different sentences or single words. So it's quite flexible in that respect. And there are some excellent packages out there for doing that. Things like Sentimenta are very good because it doesn't just look at the individual word and say, well, that's a positive word. It looks at the context that the word is sitting in. So the words that surround it. If you've got something was very bad, it will give it a lower scoring towards the negative end. Or if something was very good, it will put it higher up, as opposed to just being good as a positive word and bad as a negative word. And so this can somehow help with identifying where these sentiments lie within the text. And again, this comes back to things like adverse events and quality of life data. If we know that there is a lot of adverse events and there's a very, very negative sentiment around these, we're probably looking at some quite strong adverse events in these texts. Quality of life, if it's very positive, maybe the things that we're looking at and the, the technologies that we're assessing actually are giving people a better quality of life. And it's just a way of kind of gauging the text and giving a bit of understanding behind the meaning there. And some of the additional perks of using R is that there are a lot of APIs out there. So PubMed is a great one. 
we can connect up to PubMed. I can draw in additional data from what's just in front of me. Um, packages like Easy PubMed are very good for doing this, but it gives me that bit extra. So I'm not limited to the 10 papers that I've been given by a clinician. I can go and search elsewhere and draw in other data from different sources, different databases, and it's really good for doing that. It can be time saving in the long run because I'm not having to sit and read through paper by paper by paper, manually extracting the data by hand. It's given me a quick snapshot and an overview of what's in there so I can see what's important and what's not. And the great thing about having these pipelines is that you can always add to them. You can add more, you can take bits away, you can adjust them to suit your needs, whatever that may be in whichever part of the HTA report you're working on. And once set up, these pipelines are easy to use again. They're just there, ready to go. So you can reuse them time and time again on different sets of data. And so these can really be used in any different part of the HDA report, anything that uses text. I personally use them to help me with the literature sourcing. Um, we have used it to help with sort of the systematic review elements and again, in economic evaluations and horizon scanning efforts and it's not limited to just my uses it's available across a broad range of things that go into it and so we can get again these wonderful outputs there's lots of different graphical outputs to choose from ggplots and wordcloud 2 are the two of the most common packages for doing these outputs and they're adaptable so you can change the color or the size or the scale of them you can quite easily save these as jpegs P uh, pngs and you've got those files ready then to put into your report as you need them you can do tabular outputs that can be saved as excel files or csvs and again these are very adaptable so you can add and remove columns you can change the data around you can transverse it and this is quite easily doable with the base functions that are available in R, but there's also other packages to help with this. And the last word on Shiny, we've had a very good talk already today on Shiny and my personal opinion, it's one of the best R packages out there. I think it's fantastic. It's a web development package that allows you to create these reactive web pages. So you can set them up so that users can input their own data and they can manipulate the text with sliders and buttons and input boxes and it will uh, allow it to automatically update the content and give you a, this reactive environment to the data that you're seeing and some of my future plans are to create a more extensive text mining tool using some of the pipelines that I'm, I use on a daily basis and to be able to give this pipeline within a shiny context um, to allow people to use it quite easily without any knowledge of R. But I noticed before in the chat, there was a couple of questions around Shiny coming up and somebody had asked, I'm sorry, I apologize, I didn't catch names, but somebody had asked um, whether you could create these Shiny web pages and make them look nice and pretty without having to manipulate HTML or CSS code or anything like that. The answer is yes, you can. It's very easy to do. There are a lot of people out there, especially even in the CRAN network now, who are developing extra packages to help you with manipulating Shiny in ways to get it to function how you want it to and to look the way you want it to. Um, second question was around the use of Shiny in systematic reviews. There are an awful lot of Shiny web pages out there that are available to help with different portions of systematic reviewing. Things like developing your Prisma diagrams, um, doing your risk of bias graphs, all those sorts of things are available. As far as I'm aware, there isn't one that has an end to end functionality to it. So there are different ones that can be used individually to help you with this. Um, so that was my, my quick sort of whistle stop tour. And just on a last note of where you can get help and support if you're beginning with these sorts of things. There are a lot of forums and tutorials available out there. So there's places like Stack Overflow, Twitter, YouTube, Our Ladies are all brilliant places with some really good help and support out there. We tend to find that the R community is very supportive of one another. And if you ever get stuck, there's always somebody on hand to help. 
there are short courses and events available, places like Meetup have a lot of groups that are very involved with R and like to give presentations um, about current work, about development and what packages they're designing. There's lots of short courses that are available and there's a whole world of R support out there that's available to everybody. And so that brings me to the end of my, my quick talk. I hope you found that of some interest. Um, I know it's been slightly different to everybody else's and to, to come at it from a different angle than the economic standpoint. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. And uh, my email is on the slide, so please feel free to email me anything after this as well. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Hannah. Um, I thought as a, a statistician economist, I had seen everything, but I didn't know that R had a package to judge the sentiment of a paper. Um, so <laughs> thank you for exposing us. Um, Dawn Lee has a few questions, so I'll just ask her to unmute. Cool. Um, thanks, Howard. Um, really interesting presentation. Thank you so much. I think my main question is um, a lot of us will be used to seeing SLRs as part of nice HTA. How much of that would you be comfortable automating currently with the standard of the packages, for example, the text readers, versus where would you need actual personal input at the moment? I think most of it actually is pretty good. Um, the packages that are available out there are quite extensive. I know a lot of the shiny websites that are available to help have been developed by people in the systematic review field. So it's done by people who know the process very well. Um, there, there will always be an element of needing human input, especially when it comes to things like double screening. A machine won't do it all for you. You are going to need a second person to check things. Um, but I think there's, there's quite a lot of scope for actually using R to do these sorts of things. And I think it's well worth the investment going forward for people to try and develop packages that are a complete end-to-end -end run of the process and I think it would be very useful. Thanks Hannah. Um, we have one more, we have another question from uh, Sha Wang Stiverding. I'll just see if they're willing to Or Porik, would you like to ask your question in person? Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, thanks for a great presentation, Hannah. Um, so there's, there's a big ecosystem in Python for this kind of analysis. And I wonder, is there a good reason for starting with or for doing this apart from the fact that we might all be familiar? Um, because potentially you could do some of this in Python and then feed it back into, into R later. You could, yeah. Um, there's absolutely no reason why you can't interconnect the two and use them both. Um, from my standpoint, I think I'm just slightly more comfortable using R. Um, I do have some experience with Python and Java and other programming languages, but for me, R was always my kind of go-to package of, of programming language. Um, so for me, that's where I'm most comfortable. And I think really, realistically speaking with any programming, it's very much what you're comfortable with and how you how confident you feel that the code that you're writing is doing what you expect it to do. So I hope that kind of answered your question. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, does anyone else want to ask a question? I'll just invite In that case, thank you very much, Hannah, um, for a really interesting presentation and a real change of topic. <laughs> um, 